Welcome to Pear Fair with Cajon Valley Union School District. My name is David Miyashiro. I'm the superintendent. My colleague, my, my best friend at work, will you introduce yourself? My name is Ed Hidalgo. I'm the Chief Innovation Engagement Officer, and I get to work with my best friend at work, Dr. David Miyashiro. We're super excited to be here with you today, and our vision for our community is to make our community the best place to live, work, play, and raise a family. Vision for our students, happy kids engaged in healthy relationships on a path to gainful employment. And we're going to share quite a bit about that as we get into our presentation today. And so one of the things that unites us here at Parafair is our technology footprint. All of us in some shape or form are killing it, crushing it in digital interfaces with our students and maximizing distance learning and blended learning. We started our journey back in Cajon Valley uh, in 2013 with a one-to-one -one initiative. And when we started, we thought about the phrase, less tech, more human. And what that means is we use technology to do the blocking and tackling, you know, assessments, data, accountability, all the stuff that, um, that was labor intensive and freeing up more time for human connections, small groups, one-on-one -on -one, and relationships. And so that started a conversation about tools and software. Pear Deck wasn't invented back in 2013. But there were some tools that helped with engagement, tracking, progress monitoring, and adaptive solutions. And then as we got better at it, our chief technology officer, John Gurton, who's a wizard uh, with data interoperability and data science and cybersecurity, really created a user interface that made sense for all people, including the parents now in distance learning. Kids log into their Chromebook, they're logged into all their apps. And so Almost a decade ago, we started this conversation of moving from a teacher centric to a student centric learning model. And back in the summer of 2014, we had our first blended learning summer school. And here's what that looked like. We invited students using our Title I funds to come and learn with devices and experiment and, and hack on blended and personalized learning. We had our teachers utilize data to group kids into small groups and really personalized learning based on interests. And that was really the beginning of our journey as we launched into the digital divide, which lent perfectly to a transition in March to distance learning because we had to. The world shut down and this is what it looked like in Cajon Valley uh, right after the world shut down. Since 2014, we've been working on a blended learning model where we're working with the students in person with their learning, but we're also working with them on their computers. And that transitions right now beautifully towards distance learning. It's allowing us to keep those personal connections and allowing us to work with the students through their computers to continue the success that we've had with their education. We get to do our weekly video chat through Zoom. My kids get to see their teachers. They get to see their friends. Our teachers are amazing. And I'm gonna share a little bit about our modern curriculum that went through our distance learning. We're gonna go into depth uh, when Ed comes on and later in the presentation. Distance learning will include a playlist of basic skills, subject matter, and Cajon Valley modern curriculum, which includes TED-Ed, computer science, social emotional learning, as well as world of work. So we will be able to monitor student progress and engagement using computer adaptive tools while honoring the need for rest, play, as well as family time for all members in our learning community. And that was the beginning. And I think every one of us uh, on this presentation in this panel uh, can relate. We all can remember that day in March when you said, what, the schools are closed? And then, you know, what are we gonna do next? And so distance learning is what we had to do. One of the things that we learned early on talking with our parents is that even though distance learning was, was a, a smooth transition, a lot of parents uh, were in crisis mode and they said, you know, I, okay, distance learning is great, but uh, I have to go to work. And both of my wife and I are essential workers. Who's going to help my kid with distance learning? Do I have to quit my job? And so we responded with free childcare for essential workers. So I'm in law enforcement and my wife is a nurse and uh, we have two kids, second and third grade. And uh, when we heard of this program, uh, it was it was really a relief for us because we've been uh, it's been a little stressful for us not knowing exactly what we we're gonna do since we both work uh, and uh, it's it's been a blessing for us. And that was Saul, one of our parents, and we're, we're grateful to our families for giving us really good feedback about what they needed, so we can design. The other thing we heard from our families is aside from the curriculum and the learning, 
they're missing their friends and they're missing the other adults in their lives that cared about them. And so as part of getting our kids back to some normalcy and carrying on their social emotional needs, we invited all teachers to open enrichment and free learning classes for our students and invited all parents that felt safe at the time to send their kids for, for free summer learning and enrichment. Some of my favorite takeaways are seeing our students and staff being excited to be working with one another again, uh, to be able to take a lap on the field safely, to be able to cook, to be able to create in our makerspace. And it's been uh, a fun and exciting way uh, for our um, staff and students to practice what our new school year might look like. So we use that as a learning during summer to help our teachers and administrators start to think about, you know, how would we start the school year? But Leilani talks about what it meant for her and her, her friends to come back to a place that they missed. I think the best thing um, of coming back here was that we all get to see each other again. It's been a very long time since we've seen each other and that while we're doing it, we are safe. With the start of school closure, we took it very seriously. We went nowhere for a solid three months. Having the opportunity where we can send our children back to an environment that they're familiar with, they hadn't seen and were missing so much, was really helpful. When I would pick him up after summer enrichment, he would start from the moment that he got out of the car, what he did, who he saw, like he gave a play-by-play. -play. It lit him up to have that opportunity and continue to have the opportunity. And we're so grateful for our employees who opened 27 schools serving 6,000 plus students and never stopped service to our community in terms of the basic needs that a school district provides, especially in a Title I environment. And that led to a transition back to in-person learning at the start of the school year where we gave our parents choice. It wasn't just all kids back in school. We leaned into our parents to see what do they want in the school year. Our schools are a place where students go for safety, for food, and that security and that routine. And in a time of turmoil in our lives with COVID, schools have just really become a safe place for students. I personally feel that when students walk in that door, they're walking into a place to thrive and be their best every single day. Here at school, we keep each other safe by wearing a mask and then social distancing with each other and hand sanitizing and washing hands more often. I like to come back even though I'm wearing a mask because I still want to be with my friends and all kinds of stuff and do all kinds of computer work and be challenged. Seeing all of the children just interacting with their teachers, seeing the smiles on their faces and just the fact that they're happy to be here is a really good feeling. Whether families want to continue to distance learn, we have that option. Or whether families want to come back to school in a safe environment, we have that option too. That's trustee Joe Alegria, one of our five bosses. This is where they meet. And right on top of the dais is our, our mission to make community the best place to live, work, play, and raise a family. And on top, happy kids engage in healthy relationships on a path to gainful employment. And if you look at the, probably the far left of what you're looking at, that's where Ed sits. Ed, you want to talk a little bit about our board, our mission, our, our vision? Because really, we, we changed everything when we met you back in, in 2016 in Qualcomm. Well, I don't know if that's the case, Dr. Miyashiro, because you were already on a path to bringing blended learning one-to-one -one for all of our students. To think that every one of our eighth graders has had their own Chromebook for every year of their educational history in Cajon Valley is amazing. And we know that wouldn't be without uh, possible without you and it wouldn't be possible without our incredible trustees. How fortunate are we uh, to have such engaged trustees that get the work that we're doing and the transformation that you've put in place here in Cajon Valley. Wouldn't be possible without you and it wouldn't be possible without them. But if we hadn't met you, it probably would read happy kids engaged in healthy relationships, <laughs> doing really good on standardized tests. <laughs> on a path to gainful assessments. Exactly. But no. <laughs> Tell us about this slide and, and what we're doing here. We know that education and the world of work for too long have been separate. They've and certainly there's been great advancements um, in bringing business into education over the last decade or so. And 
um, our work is really to blend the two. And it's not just about starting this in high school. We have to start in the early grades. We have to bring professionals right into our classrooms. And now we can do it virtually. We can do it in person. And so this is the work that's happening in our, in our classrooms across our school district. It's a systemic and community-wide experience. Thank you. So fortunately, not happy kids, healthy relationships, great test takers. It's gainfully employed. <laughs> And we know to be in the best place to live, work, play, and raise a family, you have to have a J-O-B, right? That's true. And so we, we've come to really adopt this quote from founding father, John Adams. There are two educations, one to teach us how to live and the other how to make a living. And most of what we do in K-12 pre-pandemic didn't align to either of those two goals. And that's really where the, the mission and the vision for our school district came. And here we are. As soon as school shut down, we knew that we wanted to keep serving our students and our community. And we also knew that was gonna take a huge team effort. Everyone from child nutrition to IT department, teachers, principals, custodians, everyone was ready and willing to show up for our students. I did weigh you know, my health concerns. When I weighed that decision, it was just overwhelming that I, I, I felt like I needed to be there for the children. Looking at their faces and their smiles as they come and they say thank you, that experience right there, there's no words for it. And I'm going to stop it right there. That, that video really goes into the story of, of how we responded from March through today. But I wanted to show you the faces of our employees, their teachers, our classified association, and our parents. And we realized that in order to achieve our vision and our mission, that culture matters. And we borrow this from business and industry. Ed is going to talk more about some of the tools and the theories we use that align with what the Fortune 50 and Fortune 500 companies use but really the culture of an organization shaped by the worst behavior the leader is willing to tolerate. And that's something that takes a lot of a nerve and, and you know, courage to stand up to, but this is why it's so important. Laszlo Bach used to be the chief human resource officer, the chief people officer for Google. He now has his own company, is doing amazing work in, in, in personnel, but also leadership. Laszlo, we met at Google uh, back about six years ago and I heard him give a keynote where he talked about why Google does the things they do. And here's him talking about work. We had this epiphany a while back that you actually spend more time working than you do doing anything else in life. I mean, if you add up the hours, particularly now that we've all got devices and we're connected all the time, you spend more time working than you do sleeping. You spend more time working than you do on your favorite hobbies and favorite activities. And the crazy thing is you spend more time working than you do with the people most important to you in the world. Your spouses, your family, your parents, your best friends. You spend more time with these people you work with. And it's kind of crazy. It's crazy that for most people in the world, work is not better than it is. And then right after this talk, I couldn't wait to talk to Laszlo, but one of the people from Pearson who was there with us, an executive, raised her hand, not with a question, but a comment. She said, Laszlo, you guys just want to have your employees work so hard that you get you know, 10, 12 hours out of them a day. That's why you feed them, you give them bicycles, you take care of their dry cleaning. And he says, sheepishly, I, I, I understand your comment, but I think you have it all wrong. You see, our, our employees are parents and their spouses and they have lives outside of work. And we want when they leave here after an eight hour workday to have their personal life. So we take care of all those things for them while they're here. And that's about taking care of our people. Another great company to model after is Starbucks. And when they started, they had the question, you know, are we gonna be in the coffee business? And early on they said, no, we're gonna be in the people business selling coffee. Interesting. And that mindset allowed them to serve their employees as their first customers. They offer them healthcare and a lot of latitude in the way they do their job. They foster teamwork and happiness at work. And those lessons really led us to try to do things to build culture here in Cajon Valley. And here's just an example of what culture looks like when it's clicking on five cylinders.
And so we share that not to show a viral video, but to show the process of building up to a moment like that and what opportunities it can bring for the employees who work in different schools and different departments to build friendships and relationships. We go together. Happy kids engaged in healthy relationships on a path to gainful employment really means happy employees engaged in healthy relationships and join their employment. And this is Ed's first flash mob back in 2019. We got him. I thought this was a party. <laughs> Let's dance. <laughs> you have PTSD awesome. right now, Ed? Yeah, I do. I do. I'm not big on dancing. <laughs> and even though. Uh, we have a hate hate relationship with NBC now. Here's them talking about us back then. District, they were also involved in today's flash mob. Yeah, Elkhorn police were there, Heartland firefighters, even some city council members. <laughs> Those guys are good. Legit. You say yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, this is the one from this year, uh, pandemic flash mob. I'm just going to show you a piece. It's a recognition of our interdependence that requires <laughs> of this moment that we direct a statewide order to stay at home. We need to bend the curve. We need to recognize the reality. We did a, a, a mashup of Don't Stand By Me and, and Don't Stand So Close To Me. And um, the full video is on our YouTube channel, but in the interest of time and content, want to get back to our vision and mission. And Ed, they're going to see the video from uh, our World of Work partners that Bill Wells narrates. So you just Super. preview what, what they're going to see in terms of the experience to get some context. Yeah, so this, this uh, opportunity, this video is a compilation of our Meta Pro experiences, just like Dr. Miyashiro mentioned earlier on that slide, bringing business together with education. And uh, this is a compilation of actual Meta Pro experiences where we've been community partners, our business partners, into classrooms live using virtual technology, using Zoom technology to reach hundreds and thousands of young people. And watch the engagement on the employers and the people in our business community uh, talk about healthy relationships. The Cajon Valley School District is doing amazing things. This is not just innovative from a San Diego County perspective. This is innovative from a world perspective. There can be a large disconnect between the actual workplace environment and what uh, you're learning, learning in school. All right, children, are you ready to go on an adventure with me? Because today we're going to go on an adventure to tell you all about costuming in theater. It's not every day that we do so much live discussion and conversation. So that was a turning point for us. So I have to thank uh, the World of Work program. So today we taught a bunch of young scientists how to extract DNA from their cheek cells. Illumina is so important as we unlock human health with the power of the genome. And these young scientists are going to help us in the future. I think it's important to the community. I think it's important to people. I think it's important to the environment. I love doing it. This has been such an amazing experience just because I've gotten to do what I've always loved to do. It's amazing to show it to children and people thinking about doing it and you can do anything you put your heart out to. It's really awesome to be able to mentor and 
help share some things that have really helped me along in life. And just to see the smiles on their faces and the energy it was just an awesome day all, all around. And I think that this gives kids some tangible ideas about how they might think about their skills and their talents and put that to work in the future. No matter what your strengths, interests, and values are, you have your place here at SeaWorld. You know, they say that if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. And so find your happy place, find the thing that you like to do, and then go ahead and work to increase your talent in that thing. It's so important for these students to know there's a bright future right here in our hometown. I grew up through foster care and I was adopted and I was taken care of the community that was all around me. And now it's my turn to take care of the community. Cajon Valley is the best place to live, work, play, and to raise a family. Great community, I think we're, we're getting there. And, and Ed, I know these are gonna come up later in your slides also, but <clears throat> from your work in, in private industry to Qualcomm, to hear your expertise in, in employee engagement, but also community engagement, can you share a little bit why what this data is and why it matters? And I'll start with the Q12 and maybe then just focus on the middle there. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the, the ability for an organization to have data around employee engagement is critical um, and it tells us a couple of things but number one um, do people feel mattered at work and are coaching conversations happening you know the ability to develop uh, people in our workplace is a direct um, connection to the coaching conversations and leadership that we have in our supervisors and managers and so we need this data to be able to understand what's really happening within our enterprises and then put uh, measures in place to be able to support uh, our leaders and managers uh, to be great coaches and great developers of people. And when we do that, um, great thing, great outcomes happen. Um, and it perfectly aligns with the work that Dr. Miyashiro has brought into Cohen Valley. Yeah, so those, those uh, down the middle of the Q12, at work, does my opinion seem to count? Is there someone at work that encourages my development? Does my supervisor, someone care about me as a person? These are the, the, questions we ask our employees really as a gauge of performance on their managers and principals and directors, right, Ed? It's a, how's that Correct. used in corporate America? Oh, it's ab used in the absolute same ways. Really, as I see our school sites, it's no different than a business unit within a, corp a major corporation, uh, whatever corporation that might be in any industry. Um, you know, our, our greatest cost is, our, is our, our staffing, our personnel, our human resources. And if our employees aren't fully engaged in their work, um, then we're, we're in some cases, we're, we're wasting money, but we're also not um, helping those individuals develop to become their fullest possible selves. So when we encourage and train managers, develop managers to be able to have these conversations and we help um, our employees know what's expected of them at work, um, then we can have a mutual relationship of development, not just what's good for the employee, but also what's good for the organization. And since Ed's come on, we started using these data tools and Ed share, I mean, in the time you've been here with us that help uh, our audience make sense of this data. Definitely. And we'll touch on this a little bit um, in my sharing. This data uh, is possible again, because leadership, our board, our superintendent saw the importance of bringing in measurable uh, uh, tools that can provide measurement around um, how our employee population, what's the health essentially of our employee population. And so in three years of measuring and integrating um, employee engagement um, as a priority, we were able to move our employee workplace from a ratio of three to one, meaning three engaged employees across certificated and classified to everyone actively disengaged. And these are people that are, um, uh, of course, dissatisfied in their work, um, but also recruiting others to be dissatisfied in many cases. Mm -hmm. You know, these are folks who are cranky on the job, not happy in their roles. And in three years, we were able to move from three to one to 10 to one. 10 engaged to everyone actively disengaged. A major shift, several hundred employees were moved off of the category of actively disengaged that moved into engaged and um, actively engaged. So 
it, it um, has been quite a transition. And as you can see on the Gallup chart of studying corporations across the globe, um, we're now ranked in that best practices differentiated workplace culture, and we're hoping to go even further than that. Thank you, Dr. Miyashiro. Yeah, thank you. I'm sure everyone listening is like, oh, we don't have any disengaged people in our place. We, we don't have any cranky people at our place. <laughs> everyone loves professional development and is always all paying attention and no one's doing, you know, anyways. But um, we actually put culture as part of our budget and we encourage our principals and directors to invest in opportunities and shared meals and experiences that will give people a, a chance to build friendships. And so here's what uh, that looks like when you do professional learning with a focus on culture and engagement. Here's our people, and here's our people engaged. CV Conference is multiple days of professional learning for classified and certificated staff in Cajon Valley. We like to end our conference with something fun and light and motivating to kick off the new year. This year, our theme is the 80s. It's just a great time to build those relationships with your staff, with your coworkers, before the year starts. We're more than a number here. We're actually a family, and I feel we have the opportunity to have so much input in moving forward in everything this district is doing to meet the needs of all of our students. CV Conference is great because you get a chance to learn new things and connect with people and have a positive start to school year. There's a lot of things I've done in my 31 years that I think can help, but then there's teachers that have been here one year and can teach me new things. This was a great opportunity for me to see what is going on in the schools, the impact the programs that we implemented have on these students. What's nice about this experience is it's not just a bunch of people shuffling from class to class, there's a theme, you know, you get a chance to show your creativity. It makes it more fun, it makes it more lively, it's entertaining, it's not just this thing that you have to do, but it's the thing that you want to go to. We have over a hundred sessions being offered. We have sessions for everybody. We want to make sure everyone felt included and have a place where they can go learn specifically for their content. Those conferences did help me a lot doing my job in a more professional way. Being part of Cajon Valley community, it was really a good experience. When you're part of the Cajon Valley team, you are part of something bigger that no one else is doing. And I think the big picture is hearing the message, what are we all trying to achieve? And it is the vision, it is our mission. It is about happy <clears throat> kids and healthy relationships on a path to gainful employment. <clears throat> And that voice that you heard narrating is <clears throat> our assistant superintendent, Karen Minshew, and she's crushing it and she's amazing. And we're so grateful for her leadership and professional learning and engagement. And it's paid off. Um, in 2019, the Union Tribune voted us a, a best place to work. And we attribute that to our employees and our people on our board who sets the vision for us. That's also resulted in increase in student enrollment. And the bottom line is what drives a lot of us. And if you have happy employees, then you're gonna have happy kids. It's just a natural byproduct. And I wanna give credit to our five bosses. That's Jim, Karen, Tamara, Jill, and Joe, uh, left to right. And again, finish with the two educations. Are we preparing kids how to live? And are we giving them the tools and skill sets to make a living? And if we're not, then we're not cultivating happy kids engaged in healthy relationships on a path to gainful employment. And I'm gonna ask Ed to transition into his slideshow and continue on this talk uh, around what we're trying to achieve for our students, uh, how we do that through the eyes and hearts and hands of our employees and what we hope for the future. Thank you, Dr. Miyashiro. Um, it certainly is a pleasure to um, you know, share the stage here with you. And taking us through that journey is super powerful. As someone who's stepped into public education, um, you know, from the private industry. And I, I, I gotta admit, I'm, I'm excited when you show those slides of Starbucks and uh, you pull in Laszlo Bach and you talk about culture um, because everything that I've seen since I've been here makes me think that this is this is a business. This is an enterprise. You've got managers, you've got staff, you've got people across um, uh, different areas of, of, of expertise. 
I mean, to learn about the paraprofessionals and the role of IT and warehouse and child nutrition and transportation, this is a, a giant business. Yeah. And so it should be um, approached in that way. It doesn't mean that all the systems are set up in a way that uh, fosters the uh, smooth sailing in all cases. Mm -hmm. But to that, I give the credit to you and to our board who's allowed us to move this work, um, advance this work. And, and so I'm excited to share some slides about um, the role of career and career development and some of the innovation that's been taking place in, um, in the school district. What, what were your thoughts, Dr. Miyashiro, on this on kind of this idea of career development before before we start really focusing on this? What did career development mean to you? Career development was something that happened outside of school, um, and it didn't dawn on me that it should happen not just in school but through the whole process until we met you and saw our kids in eighth grade uh, for the first time see purpose in what they were actually doing during the school day as it relates to what they might do in their future. And so thank you, Ed, for sharing your gifts with us and for making career development a human process in our district. Uh, it's, been, it's been my absolute pleasure and it's been so rewarding to do this work and see just how far we can go with this idea of career development and the fact that it's, it's a human process. And when I think of the work that we do, our product is quite human, isn't it? It's, it's delivering this human experience, the social emotional experience. It's not just about um, transitioning knowledge from one to the other. It's about the growth and development of young people. And I see our teachers, our educators as the ultimate career developers and preparers of young people in the world of work. And I think one of the things that we needed to shift was this idea or this mindset and creating of new language um, to help them be able to see young people in a different way and really to be able to integrate ideas of career development grounded in career theory so that they would um, be able to see how all this connects together. One of the things that I notice is that so often um, we build silos where the career development piece maybe happens with counselors and the, um, the, learning, the learning items, the core learning happens with the teachers. Well, we saw this beautiful opportunity uh, to blend this together. And, and it started with the career development framework that um, has three core elements. We call it the mission of me. And it's this idea that every child, every grade, every year should have the opportunity to explore this as these unique aspects of self-awareness, their strengths, their natural talents, their interests, and their values, um, that they should have exposure to both academic and career opportunities, which we call the journey. It's this exploration to understand what's possible for each young person, and that every child should be able to tell their story. And Dr. Miyashiro, you are already doing an incredible job of helping young people tell their stories. Can you, can you kind of expand on that idea of, of my story and how, how you've reinvented that in Cajon Valley? Well, I'll share a little bit about the TED presentation literacy curriculum. Uh, we, we have an annual event uh, in our district that allows our kids to share their unique voice and tell their story on stage in the form of a TED-like talk. And so in that process, we're having our, our children, our young kids start talking about who they are, what they like to do and what they, where they might like to do that, but also a little bit about their family history. And when we think about equity and social justice and all the things that we're trying to do in our school systems, it's as simple as that. If we have every child in our class of 25 tell their unique story, who they are, who their parents are, what their journey is, or what their culture is, and then each other person is listening and leaning in, and our kids are learning about each other, celebrating and accepting one another, then the self-esteem and the self-awareness that we're able to give children in this mission to me is deep and it's real. And these friendships go on and, and you know continue through middle school and high school. And we have a culture of our student groups where they really understand each person's unique ethnicity, their culture, their story, their background, and their gifts, their strengths, interests, and values. Thank you, Dr. Miyashiro. And it's so powerful because it then um, bleeds on to a multi-generational strategy where the families now are stepping in. They're learning about their strengths, interests, and values. They're learning about what's possible, both academically and, and career and career-oriented pathways for their young people. And now all of a sudden they're starting to hear the story of their child as it develops in school. And they're also learning about their, to, to how to tell their own stories. So it's an incredible, incredibly powerful 
foundational framework that is district wide and deployed in a systemic manner. And, and so this is career development. This is the world of work blending business and, and education. And then we drive the implementation of this work. And these are, these are four elements and stops along the journey for a young person to explore the world of work as it relates to exploration, simulation, having these as if experiences, PBLs, meeting professionals. We talked about that earlier. You saw that beautiful compilation video of young people meeting professionals both in person and digitally, virtually, remotely. In some cases, a thousand young people on a live virtual chat with a professional that they would have never have had access to. And this fourth level of, ex, um, of practice and our demonstrations of learning. Imagine if we can run this thread for every young person as they experience careers, the world of work, jobs, things that they're interested in, explore, simulate, meet a pro and practice. And in our world, we make this possible. Imagine that a young person through our framework, through the World of Work initiative that was born here in Cajon Valley, that a young person who finishes in eighth grade would have a minimum of 54 World of Work experiences. Um, and I'm gonna to touch on those headers here in a moment. I'm gonna ask Dr. Miyashiro to share as well. But as you can see, there's this beautiful diversity of work in this grid. There are careers that require advanced degrees, um, uh, undergraduate degrees, trades, certificates, uh, apprenticeships. We believe in dignity in all work. Dr. Mishra, does it get you excited? Yeah, and I, I just share one anecdote. I was looking at the career grid right now and reflecting on year one in, in, at Rios in fourth grade. We went to talk to kids in, in getting their experiences in the world of work. And you asked, um, Sammy and I forget his friend's name. Do you remember? It was there are two boys, Stuart, Sammy and Stuart. And and you said, guys, what are you thinking about this? And they said, well, you know, before World of Work, I I thought I wanted to be a football player, but now I might be an engineer or a geographer. <laughs> and then we knew if you can get a kid to you know you don't want them to crush their dreams about being a professional athlete because all of us had them, but if you can start them thinking early about real careers and visualizing that, that, that it's just awesome. And that was year one. That was year one. I remember that moment and, and we have it on video. So it was just epic <laughs> to hear, to hear them both say that it was so unexpected. So, so I, I want to send you away with a gift um, of knowledge around those headers that you see there, those six headers and each of those um, career um, columns. And um, because it's an important aspect of the work that we do. And we realize that it's often something that many teachers have not experienced. And so the way that we classify students' interests and we ground in interests is we use the RIASEC framework. It's Holland's um, framework uh, um, that connects back to career theory. It's person, environment, and fit. And it's the most widely used um, uh, uh, frame, framework to classify and organize interests. And we use it as that that core foundational element of our work. And it's, uh, it's super powerful for a lot of reasons. Um, but one of the most powerful is that it's, it's simplicity. And it's the way that Holland um, created the RIASEC was to be simple. And so starting in kindergarten, uh, youngsters are able to um, start to differentiate their interests and self-report their interests and build agency and agentic striving around their interests based on the Holland codes. Has that surprised you, Dr. Miyashiro? Because I know you've taught across all grade levels and now you've seen the RIASEC integrated at lots of different levels. How, how has getting to know the RIASEC um, kind of informed your thoughts around young people's experiences in connection to the world of work? Well, early on when, when we did the initial assessment at Qualcomm and you took us through the super strong and the strong interest inventory and the career assessments, it made complete sense in terms of finding your areas of strength and interest to you know form a career pathway. What we didn't expect, what I didn't expect, is for third and fourth graders to start using this language to talk about their own interests and then seeing the value of a variety of interests in their classroom. And all of a sudden, the shy kid who's really good at building things is becomes realistic and valuable in this project-based learning scenario. It's just 
it increased the relationships in our classrooms. And that was a surprise for me. Did you expect that? I didn't expect it, Dr. Mearshire. I really expected more of the connection between understanding self and making a connection to where I could fit in the world as it relates to career. But I didn't, I didn't think how quickly the uptake would be of young people appreciating each other mm -hmm. as they understand each other's interest themes. And in a sense, their utility, because <laughs> first you right. think, well, how can you be useful to me? And then once you realize, oh, you can be really useful to me, I actually really like you too, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so there's this deep SEL component to it. Kind of like the MBTI, the Myers-Briggs type indicator, it just gives you a different language and lens to appreciate human beings and their differences, right? I, and then yeah. just a different layer. And, and, and then the beauty of home and this deep connection like any other framework that actually is tied back to these important elements like um, college majors and careers. So um, imagine that major universities like Ohio State University, Oklahoma and others, well, they use, they use, um, they use the RIASEC to classify their majors. And the ONET, the government's base of jobs, um, uses uh, the RIASEC to classify hundreds of different careers. And then the strong interest inventory uses um, the RISEC to classify career path and um, counselors use it. So there's this full and deep utility in relation to this, uh, this framing. So powerful Dr. Miyashiro. Yeah, I, I wish that we were live so we could like stop and ask like how many are seeing these things for the first time? Because the ONET, the RISEC, these types of assessments were a brand new language for me prior to meeting you and coming to see you at the Think of It Lab, it's really not something that is measured in terms of success, in terms of K-12 uh, accountability. And if it doesn't get measured, does it get done? I don't know. No. Well, and I, I think that's what I'm most proud of in our work and our coaches in the world of work integration. We'll talk about it in a minute, but being able to teach teachers and coach teachers how to do this work has been an absolute mm -hmm. privilege. So. So let's jump as we kind of advance and you touched on it earlier, this idea of engagement, how important it is in our district and as an enterprise and this, this connection really, because this idea of engagement and really being able to define engagement and what is it? And we, we partner with Gallup and they, they've helped us. And I've again, done this in private industry, but really understanding that when we're engaged, we are involved with enthusiastic about and committed to the you know, pick whatever you want there, your business community, your school community, your church community, your volunteer community. And it's true for employees, students, and parents. It's, it's, it's true for anyone within that ecosystem, but we have to dive in and dig in and understand um, where are we? We have to understand the data and have the data to understand where are we today? And so as Dr. Miyashiro and the board have helped us advance we've seen the vision already and the importance of the language that we use you've seen the language already we've talked about interests and strengths we've talked about sel you've heard it embedded in the conversation we've been happy having healthy relations relationships the idea of presentation literacy and then moving your voice out into the world you've seen the impact of technology pair fair i mean we're here we're like the technology i know our teachers are using it and it's student-centered and this idea even of financial empowerment and knowing my place in the world, it's about safety for young people. This is the environment that we're working to create, right, Dr. Miyashiro? That's right. So, so it, it is a, a blending for our school sites and here's a beautiful measure of engagement. Imagine this Title I school, so diverse. Young people from around the world that have immigrated into our community at this site and to see uh, the number of the percentage of engaged, this is a fifth grade. We use the Gallup student poll. It's a fifth grade on up. Maybe some of you have seen the data. Let me tell you, uh, it's powerful to see what a school can do in terms of changing their, their data around the Gallup student poll. And these are exactly the measures you're speaking of, right, Dr. Miyashiro? Hope and engagement. <clears throat> yeah, has to be done. So again, you've seen the the uh, the measures, the Q12 measures that Dr. Miyashiro brought up earlier, this is part of our work. It's part of the work that we measure. And as we integrate with young people, not just strengths for our students, but again, we speak the language of strengths and interests with our employees, with the adults, 
because people who focus on using their strengths are, as we know from Gallup's research, three times as likely to report having an excellent quality of life. And you can see the engagement uh, number as well. The, again, your employees are your greatest costs in business. They're the biggest value that you have. And if you're not driving engagement, this idea of them knowing um, you know, what their role is, why their opinion counts, do they have a best friend? Is someone work, working with me to develop my future? Then we're missing, we're missing the boat. And so the work that we've done, imagine 1,800 employees have, co have come through um, in our last survey last June. Um, our participation rate would be higher. We do include our subs in that, in that um, survey rate. It's a different population and we're working on making sure that more of their voice is heard in this, but I want you to know they're absolutely part of the process. And in that third year, as Dr. Michio was showing that ratio earlier, we, our scores have improved in 12 categories, but especially, especially in these six areas, recognition, cares about me, development, my development, that my opinion counts, the mission and purpose of my organization is becoming more clear for our employees, and, and more importantly, they're seeing progress. And so when you see this transformation over time with this visual, hmm. you can see the bell curve, how it shifts over time. It doesn't happen all at once, but you can see that our principals, our managers, our supervisors have been um, receiving the tools. We've been taking them through the coaching. They've been learning and implementing. And now we're starting to see the fruit of this hard work. Dr. Miyashiro? I was just admiring your slide. I'm going to steal that slide. You put it in my presentation. <laughs> I like it better. <laughs> well, I have to thank the Gallup folks for that, you know. But again, this is part of the work. This is you too can can drive engagement in your organizations. Um, if we can support you in any way, please let us know. And I think again, it all goes back to this idea of innovation. And uh, you know, earlier we talking about the world of work and and this just this passion, this desire, this love for. Um, teaching teachers how to bring this work into the classrooms and we can only scale ourselves so far as coaches and supporting other districts so we are so proud to share a partnership dr mayor do you want to share what what this partnership means to cone valley and to um, other districts potentially yeah for us it, it really ties in literacy and adaptive learning to career development and gives our teachers a one-stop shop to access it but it was also a way for us to be able to share that with you and share that with your district and your colleagues to, to in, engage your kids in career development and gainful employment. And a, Achieve 3000 was what we used before. Their CEO, Saki Dodelson, back in 2018, sold that company and over two and a half years built Beable and then integrated the world of work into this solution. And now it's a place where all kids can find happiness, healthy relationships, and a path to gainful employment. And for us, this ability to integrate the RIASEC, the world of work, maintain the human process as we teach teachers how to bring this into the classroom. Um, like Dr. Miyashiro said earlier, less, more human. Um, we teach how to bring this work into the instructional core, but also provide the adaptive learning technology um, so that teachers can use this in a blended and personalized learning environment. So a student record, a learner record, where young people can actually start seeing their future possible selves based on where they are today and where they're headed. They understand the Lexile level, not just of themselves, but of the career that they're interested in down the road. And we started seeing that very early on. Did we not, Dr. Miyashiro? Young people were making that natural connection. We had the Lexile level on our career cards and the students were noticing. How powerful was that for you? Yeah, possible future selves and relevance to what I'm doing right now in my classroom and why I might work a little bit harder, right? So this work, as we said, is a two-gen process. I need to know if you're doing career development, if you're not bringing in a strategy that brings families, we've had more than 5,000 families now come in um, through our family and community engagement office, Mike Serban and the team, unbelievable, working with our World of Work coaches. Our parents are learning about strengths, interests, and values. We're building a common language, not just between the teacher and the child, but now the family's involved, the caregivers are involved, and for many of those family members, believe you, when we believe us, when we when we survey them, we ask them, what do you want support with as a member of our community? They say, I want a better job. Mm -hmm. And when they start with this aspect of career development, because they all tell us the same thing as well, 
I wish I'd had this when I was my child's age. I wish I had this when I was in school. Now, not only are the, are the adults um, and students coming through the process, but the students and adults are thriving together. Dr. Mishiro? Yeah, it's just that question of how do you break the cycle of poverty? If we're focused only on the students, then we're not gonna break it. it it's, it's just a cog in the, in the wheel. To break the cycle of poverty, you have to help the whole family. And it's a conversation with everybody, including the parent on their own path to income mobility. So we're gonna finish with the fact that we're never, uh, we're never satisfied with our work and the advancement of the, our uh, World of Work Initiative and career development and family and community and our workforce board um, continues on to uh, even to, into, our, into our library spaces with our Launchpad Career Center. We'll be integrating all of our World of Work materials um, we'd love to be supporting you. We're supporting other districts as well uh, with some of this, uh, this work in many different unique ways. Uh, but Dr. Mishiro, I think it's just been an amazing time with you today. I'm so thankful to be able to share and learn from you. Um, every time you know, we get to present, I learn something new and I just appreciate you so much. Thank you, Ed. Love you, brother. And, and Pear Deck, thank you for including us and inviting us to Pear Fair and Hopefully we'll see all of you in person next year, in person at Parafair in some shape or form. And be well, reach out. We'd love to hear from you and provide any resources and, and um, just hear from you and make a new friend.